false economy on revenue numbers. It's like, hmm, that's great, but where's the profit? And where's the cost of sales? And what are your biggest, where are your margins? And and that's where they kind of go, hmm, gosh, I don't even know what our highest margin product is and what our lowest. Like level 10 meetings are always the, probably the biggest growing pain for, for clients. But the scorecard to me is what tells me um, they're absolutely running their business and the business is not running them. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by the delightful Sheila Hogan, who is a professional EOS implementer based over in Sydney uh, in Australia. And Sheila joined the team um, about a year ago, I think it was, and we immediately hit it off. And so we decided we had to have this podcast and, and talk about some of our mutual experiences. Welcome to the show, Sheila. Thank you so much. Yeah. Very excited to be here. It's going to be great. Hey, um, so tell me a little bit about how did you become an EOS implementer? What's your journey to get to where you are today? Oh, it's, a, you know, a great journey because I found my way to my my people and, um, you know, just the core values. But I, I'm a serial entrepreneur um, from the young age of what, I think 30 when I started my first business in New York City. Um, I've, I've really just grown up among people, advisors, because I was young, I, was ma- I made sure that I was always seeking out people that had gone before me and really leveraged their wisdom, their, their failures, their wins, their their key, you know, nuggets of tips and tricks. And it got me a long way. And so I built a business in the States. Then in 2010, about two years after the financial crisis, moved to Australia and continued to, I didn't want to start another business because I was tired. I had three young children. I'd moved across the world. I was living in a foreign country. I, I wasn't ambitious enough to say, I know what I'm doing here. And I just started getting a lay of the land. So what I did instead is I started running, helping other people run their businesses. So um, over the course of the past, what, 10 years, 11 years, I've, I've helped three different companies, you know, run smoother, grow faster, build an infrastructure. It's something that I love to do. I'm a natural integrator. Um, and what I found is that while I loved helping people be successful and find freedom and success in their life. I was going, what am I doing? I'm, you know, helping them be successful and I need to do my own thing again. So when I turned 50, I I did a lot of self-reflection. It was that year of, all right, what do I want to be doing the next 10, 20 years? And it's time to, it's time to get back out there. It's time to do my own thing, be my own boss, make my own success. Um, and, and I looked internally and over the course of time, I looked back on what I was doing here, who I liked spending my time with, what I, what were my unique strengths and things that I love to do that I'm great at. And it was, it was building businesses. It was helping people understand where the issues were and how to, you know, unlock those issues and, and find solutions. And I, you know, it became quicker and quicker that you could see things and then get it to the other side. So I I realized I didn't want to start a business. I didn't want to build something from scratch. I'd done it. And I really liked that there were a few models out there that I had implemented when I was running those businesses for other people, family run businesses, you know, a bunch of college roommates that were geniuses and started a great tech company and just growing crazy. Um, and I thought, who who do I like? Why do I like them? Who do I want to work with? And one of the businesses I implemented, EOS and, and Roger was, uh, Roger and Pat were my implementers mm-hmm. and just loved them. So I called them on my journey of, of exploration of what the next thing would be. And I said, tell me what you guys, what you're thinking, what you think of the idea. And they're like, oh, you've got to become, you've got to come join EOS. And, and it took me a long time because I was, I'm a high fact finder. So I did my heavy duty research. I was going to make sure that this wasn't, you know, whimsical, um, new, new launch. And I interviewed what, 15 of the 22 implementers here in Asia Pacific at the time, including my vivacious Deb, um, and, and the two other models that I had been introduced to. So, you know, competitive analysis, did my Excel spreadsheet, but resounding you know, yes, the model I loved and I had implemented it twice and seen huge results in a very short amount of time. So I knew it worked Mm -hmm. and I loved the IP, 
but I also like the autonomy that it allowed for me to be me. Um, but the other, the other, you know, tipping point was the call, the community, like the people, the EOS community worldwide is absolutely living up to everything that I researched. Everybody, they brought it. And I was like, these are my people. So long story short, that's it. It's not only the model that I've actually implemented myself into businesses and seen the results. So I, I deliver it with authenticity and conviction, mm -hmm. but the community. People yeah. like you and I, Deb, we are aligned in our core values and our and our hopes and help first intention. Absolutely. And uh, it's probably part of the reason I kind of fell in love with it too is that it's definitely the people. But I think also, as you said, it's like there are lots of frameworks and models out there and they're all really good. So there's nothing wrong with any of them, but some of them just get a little bit too complicated. And I think for entrepreneurs, we, we don't, we need a little bit of structure, but if you try and restrain us too much, we just throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's too hard. I don't want to do this. Yep, you know. Absolutely. So I love the simplicity of it, that it was able to give us a, a framework, a structure without being too restrictive. And some people think it looks a bit too simple, so they're skeptical. And I go, yeah. it has to be simple. Business is complex enough. So yeah. trust that it's simple but not easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually really funny. It's, um, I did Outward Bound many, many years ago. Well, not many, about, probably about eight years ago. I was the fattest, oldest person on Outward Bound. And, and when, I, when I finished it, I was so proud of myself. They asked did I want to actually have a brick inscribed um, that could go and be put into the, the Outward Bound um, grounds. And my brick actually said... Um, it was simple, but not easy. And it's like that has now followed me through my life and everything that I do. So, yeah, cool. Um, so that was a, a, yeah, a little while ago that you joined us. Um, one of the things that you have been most proud of in the last couple of years of your life that you've achieved or of, of your whole life? Listen, I think um, being winning the entrepreneur of the year award when I was 37 years old in New York city, New York state, which is probably one of the most competitive islands in the world. So, um, <laughs> it was a real, and I was shocked. Okay. So, oh. you know, you go through the process and you're going, this is, we've got some steep competition. We're really, really lucky to be part of the process and nominated, etc. I really, I was actually here on holidays in Australia in July in the snow at Threadbow and the awards were being given in New York and we won. And I just, I literally, I fell off my chair. I just couldn't believe it. So it was a real eye opener that, you know, never, never think other people can do it better than you or that you're not, you know, shining because you're, if you're not, if you don't give it a go, you never know. And I think I'm constantly looking at times like that, that I put myself out of my comfort zone and um, shared a little bit about myself and was vulnerable and great things happen as a result of it. So that was, that's probably one of my big, 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 you know, claims to fame is that yeah. that's huge. Oh, that's something that, yeah. you know, it's not, it's, it's a little bit of validation and it keeps you going and it keeps reminding you that, you know, keep pushing. Um, so that was purely based on innovation. I, I'm a tech geek. Um, so that was a big, that was a big moment in my career. Um, and then the next big, big sliding doors moment was I'm married to an Australian and we, you know, when we got married and young and, you know, ambitious and he was living in New York and we had to, you know, have those discussions of where are you going to, where are you going to raise your children? Where are you going to have children? Where are you going to raise them? you you live you have two different countries that you call home. So what, what's the plan? You have to make this. And I quickly said this, and I love Australia. I've done, I've done Ohio. I've done 40 winters in my life. I'm really happy with the idea of raising our children and having a life in Australia. It's a beautiful country, beautiful people. Well, you know, 12 years later, three kids later and a business, my first baby, which was, you know, at that point, 150 employees, seven locations, just the pride and joy of of what I'd never imagined what could be, and you know, mix of it, it's time, it's time. Our kids are five, three, and two. It's we're going. It's time. And I was like, oh, did we agree on that? <laughs> <laughs> it was really hard because I had to, you know, you can recreate your business and career, but you can't recreate the father of your children and your husband. You know, so it was a real. It was a moment that the choices were had to be made and that was a really hard time so that was two years of unraveling my our, our life and realizing i'm moving to a foreign country and yeah i'm gonna call it home but it's not necessarily home right away so that was big um yeah. but could not to this day is like 
you know, you can thank me again. Because mm -hmm. it's not that we waited until we were 60 to start enjoying our dream together. We we left at 40 and we left a lot behind. And But we did it all for the right reasons. And I guess that'll bring me one, to one of those tips is, you know, keep an eye on your why. Yeah. Keep, because when things are really difficult and they don't feel comfortable and they don't, they're not clear, you got to go back to your why. Mm -hmm. and what's important and your core values so that was another big that's what i'm proud of that we're yep. here and thriving and, and living a beautiful life in a beautiful country and our children are thriving and and you know i've got a, a, a career and a business here that's fantastic i'm really pleased it was it is a biggie so, and I, having moved countries twice i appreciate how big that actually really is yeah okay so we, we were talking before we came on to the podcast and you you mentioned that you wanted to share some of your experiences around kind of stress and overwhelm because it's probably something that i think particularly after two years of a pandemic people are starting to feel tired they are feeling stressed and overwhelmed but even even in day to day in business this can actually kind of sneak up on us and before you know it you know we're, we're burnt out so tell us a little about your story well, as I mentioned, we, you know, I, I had a talent agency. It was a staffing agency, but it was a talent agency for fashion design and graphics and home furnishings in the States, in New York. And, um, you know, it was, it grew very, very quickly. And then the financial crisis hit in 2008 and it affected everybody. And living in New York, I was, we had friends and, and, you know, clients that they you know, Bear Stearns gone, literally things that you never thought you would ever see that we were witnessing. And um, so there was the highs, but then it's, you, you really understand what it takes during the lows. And I think that um, being vulnerable and making sure that you know that you don't need to do this alone is one of my biggest lessons. As I said early on, when I was young, I was like, I don't know everything. I, I have the I have the energy, I have the conviction to start this business and grow this business. Um, but at the end of the day, I need advisors, people that have gone before me to make sure that I don't trip. Um, and I also need to people that, you know, when my courage and confidence was dwindling, I needed to go and borrow it mm -hmm. from people that I trusted. So I'm constantly engaging with leaders type a entrepreneurial people that think that they have to carry it all on their own shoulders i'm the leader it's my business it's all on me and i go no it doesn't have to be you have a choice there and i think the whole stress and overwhelm is so so real no matter not even if you're holding a high executive job or you're running a business if you have people reporting to you depending on you their salaries are reliant on decisions that you make there is a massive burden that can either be shared um, or carried and 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 it will it's not sustainable so i always when i talk about eos and before I, I knew eos i always was very out spoken about do you have someone to talk to personal professional who are you talking to do you have an inner circle do you have a coffee group do you have a mentor group do you have an advisory board um so i think that whole Reducing stress and overwhelm is something that we always have to be talking about because it's constant, whether it's on a small level or an epic level like the pandemic, which is something no one ever saw coming. Financial crisis, you know, there's all this talk about the economic um, downturn in the, in the coming year. Everybody takes that on, but you have to make sure that you find coping mechanisms that you share the load, mm -hmm. um, you borrow, and and seek out um, support for you know courage and conviction and guidance when that happens. And there's just so many ways to do that. It's just a matter of finding the the courage to be vulnerable and to ask for the help or at least seek it. And I I guess again that that crosses between personal and professional career business you name it. It's um, it's finally what people are talking about, especially for men. Um, you know, but but sometimes it's a little bit like the frog in the boiling pot of water, right? It's it's building up on you, but you don't notice it. So, what are the kind of signs that you can look for to know that you are starting to get stressed, overwhelmed, potentially burnt out? What are the things people should be looking at to to establish that? 
I, pe other people can observe it in you or mm -hmm. you, you hear you saving there's not enough hours in the day. You always hear that. There's just not mm -hmm. enough hours in the day. Um, that's always the telltale sign that they're, they're holding on to too much, um, in, in any, or every way it's a place to start or, um, I'm busy. Yeah. I'm just too busy. I haven't had a holiday. I, you know, I, so many throwaway phrases that you just hear and you go, that's why we need to make time. Most of all, you know, um, it, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling way too much. I think travel when you look at the amount of people used to travel, it was a very telltale sign that um, it was just their life was being taken. They, they weren't running their life. Their life was running them. Mm -hmm. So you, you'd ask a few questions, but I, I always love the, the old, oh, there's not enough hours in the day. Um, my business is growing faster than I can keep up or I just don't, I'm stuck. Yeah. I'm stuck. Nothing I'm doing seems to be doing, making a difference or um, their body language. I think we were talking about like the top 10 signs of really listening to how people listening and watching. It's not what they say. It's what they do. Mm -hmm. So their actions and their body language, you can tell energy levels. If you actually, if you actually tap in, you go, oh, their energy levels are, they don't have anything left in the tank, but they keep running. Yeah. They're unhealthy and they make unhealthy choices. So um, I've been there. I, say, I recognize well, I was it because I've been there. there. Yeah. <laughs> I was sitting there going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> It's like, mm -hmm. well, that was me in 2012 and that was me in 2017. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if I'm honest, it's actually a little bit of me right now. I mean, we're coming up to the end of the Christmas, uh, the end of the year and Christmas, and I've been doing a lot of travel. And um, it's, it's the unhealthy choices. You know, I, I just know that I'm feeling exhausted, which is not like me. I'm usually very full of energy. So, yes, I, I'm reaching out and kind of going, hey, I'm going to get And I booked myself in for some self-development in January which I think will be really helpful as well. So, yeah. Okay, look for the signs, reach out, ask for some help. Um, but what about you know, this fear of, but, you know, nobody can do things that, as well as I can. And, and and if I let it go, you know, as you said, if you're the owner of the business, you're often, it's my responsibility. I need to make sure all these people are, are being paid. What would you say to that? It, it's not, again, it's not sustainable. And there is a glass ceiling. There is only so much you can do in the time given. And there's only so much that you're actually good at. And that to the degree that the, I, I really pull the red carpet right off from under them. And I say, well, obviously, you know, you're not working to your strengths. And that's not a good strategy. Has anyone told you the business strategy is actually the best leader is those that empower others to do the work? You know, it's, it's just a matter. I always ask what books they're reading because I think you either have the art of war or it's servant leadership or, mm -hmm. you know, on that spectrum. But I always say the most strategic leaders are those that don't do the work, but empower, delegate, elevate those around them. And, and they find, then they build an army of people that will never leave them because mm -hmm. they're letting them do the work that they're best at and you're not great at and, and staying in a successful environment. So it's, it's showing the other, it's shedding the light on a life that could be and why it's validated and why it's actually not a weakness, but it's a more strategic way of living your life. Mm. True leadership is empowering others and getting the most out of them and, and letting them, you know, work to their unique abilities where, they're not your unique abilities. We, we in the OS talk about, you know, the four quadrants. And sometimes if I have a whiteboard handy, I go there, you know, <laughs> are you, is this something that you love and you're good at? And how much time are you spending in the areas of, I'm maybe good at it, but I hate doing it, or I'm not even good at it and I don't like doing it. So um, you just try to shed the light on how there's people really strategic leaders in the world, very successful doing a four hour work week. <laughs> it's real. It can be real. It's just a matter of choosing to let go. Yeah. And that's a big process. So showing them, showing them how it could be and that that's not a weakness. It's actually quite small. Hmm. 
And that's part of what the EOS framework does, though. It also gives you the tools to have the confidence to let go as well, right? So we've got everybody on the same page in terms of the vision, where we're headed, who we serve, what we're doing, but also more importantly, having those kind of the data and the measurables in place so that you can um, measure how we're doing against that and you can start to understand if people actually do genuinely GWC their role and can do what is required of them. And being just pleasantly surprised that people are happy to step up, step in yes. and support you and want to help and give it to me. I can mm. do that. I can do that in half the time that it takes you. And, yeah. and I love so it. So I've seen a lot of <laughs> aha moments in those, the vision building days. Focus days are really hard. Those are, oh, those yeah. are interesting with, uh, with, you know, spending a lot of time and looking at the organization, what, what is a traditional organizational chart and flipping it around, doing it an accountability chart. That's a real, that's a real mind shift um, that I see happen a lot. And people kind of go, there's a lot of one name and a lot of boxes, mm -hmm. one name and a lot of these boxes. And that means we're going to be a very slow road to where we want to get to because their capacity is completely overextended. So when you start, when you start flushing out how some people are holding on to too much, and then you put it in a very practical, you know, two dimensional layout and they kind of go hmm yeah that's some um, maybe i shouldn't put my name in that box and that box and that box so it really does surface misalignment of but you want to get here but you're holding all of these roles and responsibilities how is there's a big gap big gap mm -hmm. between where you want to get to and how much capacity or incapacity exists in the current working relationships so i love the tools that do the work for you because it just mm -hmm. the information surfaces without you going being you know questioning it, it it just comes out the truth is always in the room um if people are honest and they're doing it together yeah yeah, as I say, I, the focus day is usually quite tough because it does challenge your your thinking around a whole lot of things. But then there's also like this level of of clarity by the time that they leave that room that that things need to change, um, and there's a willingness to actually start thinking about how that can change to achieve the results. And then, of course, vision building days are beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I love the physical changes I see in the room when they kind of realize like oh, I've got really capable people in this room. Mm -hmm. And they actually want and have the interest to do things that I can't stand doing. So it's it's yeah. beautiful to see it, but it's it's a, it's a really heavy seven hours sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes longer. I had one team I was actually working with. Yeah, we were we were there for around about I think it was eleven or twelve hours. It was a long, long day. We 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 spent six hours on the accountability chart. I mean, it was and, and it had to be done. I mean, I, you know, did I want to leave earlier? Of course I did, but no, we had to get to the outcome in six. You can't without that. Yeah, yeah. So it's good. Yeah. And of course, it's always followed by the, the next two days, which are, are much more um, about the future and getting people on the same page and ensuring that we've got that plan to achieve that that future goal as well, which I think is a lot more enjoyable for most people. But it also still has its moments, right? You know, you get those teams who um, have aha moments in terms of finally clearly articulating you know what those core values are and what their core focus is and what their big um hairy audacious goal or 10-year target is and i love seeing mm. those those moments yeah i think that people got to know the people they've been working with sometimes for five six years more in those those days and those activities and then it's yeah it, it's it's a it, it's a very a big leap frog forward of having the the important conversations it's the important conversations and yes are we all on the same page absolutely not we are absolutely not on the same page yeah and it's great because that even that discovery is like ah oh, okay now yeah. i get it now i get why we're all running different races and we're not running together so mm -hmm. that's that's another aha moment when they realize that we are not on the same page and yeah. it's not a bad thing it's just a really big learning yeah. And it's an opportunity because then you have a chance to actually deal with it. Yeah. Whereas often that 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 that, that disparity lives inside people's, people's minds, but they don't realize there's a disparity. Yeah. At some, you know, I started my, my first journey was coaching executives and individuals and entrepreneurs. And I realized that that's actually, it's a short stop. It's mm -hmm. you can absolutely enhance people and their confidence, et cetera, and, and give them the tools. But if they're not doing it with the people they're working with, the level of traction is just a little bit stop, start, stop, start. Cause there's so many, and that's why I love EOS is because the difference is you're, you've got a team 
And instead of coaching the CEO or the COO, and then trusting that they're bringing it back into the business and doing it in a way that's pure or just um, educational is that's, it's blurred. It's very Mm -hmm. blurred. So I, you know, I no longer take those individual clients that are looking for the one-to-one coaching because I say, you know what, the best gift you can give yourself is to do this with your team real time. And let me, let me do the heavy lifting and carry everyone through it. And you sit down, you sit down and be part of your team and participate and just, you know, follow and trust the process. But everyone's learning in real time and they're contributing in real time and they're moving forward in real time. And that is the difference. And when people say, what's the difference in your, your business coach? And I go, oh, I struggle with that because um, I'm not. And I'm, a lot of my, my peers are like, you're not a business coach. You would tell people that you work with teams mm. because that's a big difference. And that's what I think is a big difference is sharing the learnings, being on equal footing and not having that that hierarchy in the room and just being honest and putting it on the table and moving forward together as a team yeah yeah no i completely agree i think it's um it was it's been really interesting with some clients so you know they come into the the vision building particularly and they kind of go yeah we've got our core values we've got our core focus we've got our, our plan and then you actually go around the room and you, you ask okay great so you've got you know nine core values what are those nine core values and nobody can actually um answer it or they can't use sort of the they pull language. it up on their phone they pull yeah, yeah, it up yeah. on their phone and they read them aloud and they go oh i haven't seen those in a while yeah <laughs> I, I i always laugh i had a team of 11 shareholders who came into one of the the, the vision building days and, the, and i said i said oh we've already got a plan we've We've already got, we know exactly what we're doing. We're all on the same page. I said, great, makes my work even easier. Let's give it a go. So how many core values do you have? Nine. Okay, let's go around there. We've got 11 people who are completely invested in this company as shareholders. Let's hear those core values. And we got to three, you know, because they they, they weren't really core values. They were just um, almost like a tick box that we've done our, our, our tick box. We've got our core values. Yep, next, moving on to it. And then they had this, um, uh, we call it the 10-year target, but it was it was a whole paragraph. And it's like, how can you clearly articulate that and have everybody in the organization all understand where we're headed? So, yeah, I love it when we get those sort of aha moments. We can take all of that and, and you know, we, we don't do anything but facilitate in the room. But the team, you know, basically stills it down to that real core um, essence of the business. I think, you know, the one thing I always loved about revisiting, you know, the five dysfunctions, you know, you know Patrick Franciani. Yeah is that most of the times leadership teams are not working as a team and they're all very strong. They're very successful and knowledgeable in their area of expertise, Mm -hmm. but they're, again, they're running their own race. They're not aligned and they're not working as a team. And it's Mm. very, it's such a missed opportunity because we know that if they all got in a room and started working together and, you know, rowing the boat from the same perspective, and understanding each other's strengths and weaknesses and how they could help each other. Wow, just yeah. that momentum you can achieve. So it is true. I think people get a little bit defensive. They say leadership teams aren't always necessarily operating as a team. Mm-hmm. But then when you tell them what a team looks like and remind them, you know, what when we were on a team, there was not one person. You know, it's the, the Michael Jordan and the the coach that took to, you know the yeah. basketball team to 11 championships because there wasn't one player he was all about the team um so yeah that was that's always a reminder that leadership yeah. teams are strong personalities and they've achieved a lot to get there um then it's relearning how to be part of a team yeah and getting that trust together uh, together again yeah cool so t- tell me yeah yeah do you have a favorite eos tool um, listen to me. Like I said, I'm a big fact finder, so I'm a oh, yes. scorecard. Like I love, <laughs> I love the scorecard because, you know, the truth is in the numbers. Everything else is a story. When you come into a room and you, you know, the 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 famous meetings of everyone goes around the table and talks about the reality is is that's really great. But where are the numbers? What are we? What are we watching? What are we keeping an eye on? How are we? How are we tracking? So for me, I'm always amazed um, when I come in to businesses and they're, they're like, oh, we'll, we'll get the numbers from the accountant at the end of the month. Mm. And I go, oh, okay. So what do we have even from last month? And they don't necessarily have it in an organized manner. And that's not unusual. It's really typical. But I can tell you that 
the reason back to the, my big proud moment of, of winning the entrepreneur of the year award is because in 2006, 2005, we at that point had opened four locations. So we were in New York, we had opened up LA, San Francisco, um, New York, LA, San Francisco, and we were about to open, we were about to open London. And it was really a point at which we were trying to make sure that we had a really great dashboard of activity. Yep. And I was like, you know, we should do this fun thing and have it like the, the, the floor of the New York Stock Exchange that we had these dashboards, these monitors in every office and every 15 minutes, it updated seven key metrics. So everyone in New York saw what LA was doing and San Francisco was, and it was, it was like such real time knowledge so front of mind on what makes what is the most important thing that gets us where we want to go it's mm -hmm. these things it's not that call and it's not this it's these seven things that matter most in the business so we were communicating that to everybody and they were all seeing what each, each other was doing and that's really what a big key factor that won us that award is because we were in staffing but we looked like we were operating on the new york stock exchange because mm -hmm. we had innovative business intelligence tools everywhere just saying keep your eye on the prize and this is what's important so when i saw the scorecard i was like they're speaking <laughs> my language like it's not just me yeah. <laughs> so yeah that would probably be my number one is that's a game changer like level 10 meetings are always the probably the biggest growing pain for for clients but the scorecard to me is what tells me um they're absolutely running their business and the business is not running them. Mm. And think... it's the metrics that, are these the measurables? Like it takes a while. I'm mm. sure you go through the thing and go, yeah, these are nice numbers. But does that really tell us, is that a true indicator? If we wanna get there, watching this, is that gonna make a difference? Mm -hmm. And it's really getting to the root, the root metric or the root measurable that says really, this is what's gonna be the, the trailing indicator that will tell us that we will we'll get to seven locations or we'll get, You'll be able, we'll be able to own that manufacturing building. Um, so you you want to make sure that they're just not putting numbers down to do their homework because mm -hmm. these are like out of the box numbers. Accountants and CFOs will put down. It's like, but that those aren't trailing indicators to what we just said we want to achieve in a one year and three years and ten years and making sure that they're tied back. They're, they're tying back to each other. So yeah, that's my favorite. I love it. And I think you've made a really valid point. You know, often um, they people ha haven't got this stuff at hand really easily and then they feel a bit embarrassed that they haven't been watching it. But it's just about actually getting clear that you do need to have it and then working through it. And it can take, I don't know, three to six months to actually get a scorecard that really works for you and really gives you the right numbers, sometimes longer. So I think, you know, even just taking the first step and getting something up there that may not be the right numbers gets you to start thinking about what are the right numbers and how do we actually start to um, integrate those into the business. Yeah. Uh, and the false cards. sense of the false sense of false economy on revenue numbers. Yep. It's like, mm, that's great. But where's the profit? And where's mm -hmm. the cost of sales? And what are your biggest, where are your margins? And, yeah. and that's where they kind of go, hmm, gosh, I don't even know what our highest margin product is mm -hmm. and what our lowest margin. And you start opening those, those ways of thinking and they, they get why they're working hard and not seeing the fruits of their labor. Yeah. So it's that that you start uncovering some false economies that are out there, which is, but we did 5 million. It's like, mm -hmm. but you didn't make, you made 7% profit. Mm -hmm. We can do better. Let's, yeah. let's unpack this and let's make sure that we're watching, you know, profit margins, cost of sales and the biggest, hairiest, you know, cash flow drags that, that are out there. And I think that's the, the point too, is like, you know, it, it's better to actually be seeing these and looking and finding these kind of anomalies and going, okay, what can we do about it? Rather than living in sort of almost cloud cuckoo land, kind of going, yeah, we've got great revenue. Yeah, we've got great revenue. Oh, we didn't make any profit. Yeah. But that, and that, and that, that terrible secret that it's like, but I'm still driving the same car I did 15 years ago and I'm paying my employees and there's nothing left for me. That's real. That is so real. And it's something that they do not want to necessarily share or come to terms with it's like no no we can change this this is this is the opportunity so but that's it. very real is companies and the right people that put their, their their people first and they pay them before they pay themselves and then but then they realize there's not much left over 
and you know they're working really hard but there's it's time to work smart Completely agree. Oh gosh, you know, we could talk about I mean, EOS tools. I love them all, but you're right. I mean, the level 10 meter the scorecard, they all are absolutely game changers. Um, sadly, we can't talk all day because we are on a podcast and we have limits, which is um, sad, but true. Um, so we're going to have to wrap it up, but can you just give us, you know, the three top tips? I know you mentioned earlier um, your first tip, which was around never losing sense of your why, your purpose. Yeah. Um, what else do you have for yeah. Um, they come down to, you know, it comes down to even just what your parents used to tell you is, you know, you don't know if you don't try. So it doesn't have to be perfect. I always say good enough is good to go. Just mm-hmm. go. Just put your toe in the water. Put your foot in the water. Um, mm-hmm. You know, progress over perfection. And that's 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 the other one. And And again, you can't do it all and you shouldn't do it all. In fact, that's not the most strategic approach. So, you know, when you find your courage or your confidence, which is low, borrow some, go seek it out. Listen to a podcast of people that have gone before you. Listen to Deb's series of podcasts. Listen, read a book, um, talk to somebody, talk to a mentor or an advisor or seek out somebody and just borrow it. It's okay. You're not supposed to be able to do it all. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that would be my, you know, keep an eye on your why with the personal scorecard. Why did I do this? Why would I, why would I move to another country when I've got a thriving business? Well, because this is what's important to me, to us, to our family. Um, and that's not, that's irreplaceable. Yeah. So yeah, good enough. is good to go. Yep. Um, you can't do it all. Just make sure you share the load and, you know, have a personal scorecard that helps you keep an eye on your why. Mm, I love it. Thank you so, so much. I love the idea of borrowing confidence as well. I mean, it's absolutely true. You you don't have to. You, there's many, many different resources you can tap into and people are always really willing to help. So, you know, reach out and just just let somebody know, be a bit vulnerable and say, hey, look, I'm struggling a bit here. Can you give me a hand? Especially somebody who's been there before you. Yeah, what would you things. do? What have I you would, done? Yeah, what, I mean, what would you do? What, what have you done in this situation? People love to tell you their stories and it absolutely helps. They do. And when you don't have the energy or the confidence, it's really nice to be following along someone else's and get inspired. So. That's awesome. Hey, great. Hey, if people want to talk more to you, because, I mean, we know that you are absolutely passionate about EOS. You've got a lot of experience in terms of running business, um, you know, an award-winning entrepreneur as well. How do they get in contact with you? And what's the process for, for wanting to engage with you? I'm all about a conversation. It's, you know, 30, 60 or 90 minutes. So it's just a matter of going... Um, to my website or my actually just email me directly. I'm very accessible. Um, and it's Sheila, S-H-E-I-L-A-H at bxcollective.com.au. I'm sure it'll be on your, on your um, podcast. Yeah. yeah podcast yeah, profile. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's all about just having that initial conversation. I'm not necessarily about a form as much as I love technology, it's really having a conversation and I make it quite um, approachable and easy and comfortable, but it's, mm-hmm. it's just starting with a chat yeah. and seeing what, what you need, how I can help. And if it's a fit. Love it. Love it. Okay. Look, Sheila, um, always love talking to you. Um, so pleased we got to catch up in person, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for your wisdom. Really appreciate it. Um, look forward to catching up again soon. Thanks for doing what you do. You do it really well. It's a pleasure.